This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Let's review a little bit here. We're on the Doctrine of Christ. I guess this is part two of the handout. Um, yeah, this this review is simply for our general knowledge and repetition. Doctrine of the Bible. Anybody remember the four major sections of the Doctrine of the Bible? Yes, we got Revelation. Inspiration. Nope, not that one. Good guess, though. That was good. Illumination. Illumination. Interpretation. And interpretation. Good. And the four four major elements of the doctrine of God that we covered. We use the acronym EAST. <laughs> Why EAST? I don't know. Eternality. Attributes. Sovereignty, there we go. And T, Trinity. So, very good. All right, we are on page five, yes. Five? Do we really? Okay. Okay. I thought it was seven, but if you're all saying five, I must have got ahead of myself. All right, chapter 5, or chapter 5, wow, page 5, Christ Humanity, Christ was a man. Um, there's a, I'm going to open this little section here with, a, with an illustration I found that I thought was helpful. Uh, Dr. Stuart Nye Hutchinson tells about a boy whom he knew had lost his right hand. He felt so badly about it, and he did not, um, and he did not want to see anyone. His father said, "I'm going to bring the minister in to see you." The boy said, "I don't want to see him," but the father brought him in. When the boy looked up, he saw that the minister had no right arm; there was an empty sleeve. He came over to the boy and said, "I haven't any hand either. I lost mine when I was a boy, and I know how it feels." It wasn't hard for the boy to get acquainted with the minister who knew how it felt. So Christ has suffered for us and knows our temptations. I thought that was a really good illustration of what it, Christ took on humanity. So he knows exactly what we've went through. Um, I'll pause here for just a little bit of application. Sometimes God lets us go through things in life whether it's cancer or financial loss or different things, we go through personal trials that later on in our life, someone else is going to go through that. And we're there to say, I do know what you've been through. I do know what you're going through. I've been through this. I've been through that. And, and you can be a source of help, um, just as this minister was able to, to be to the boy. Um, so anyway, that's... That's a good illustration to open this up here. A, Christ came to earth by a virgin birth. Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew picks up on that prophecy and he then um, links that to Christ. He says, uh, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Why is the virgin birth important? 
why, what makes it important and not just this, okay, that's neat that God came, virgin birth, miraculous birth. Why is that important? Yes. Right. There's four ways man have come into the world. I'll give you a pause to think, all right? There has been no man or woman. That was God created them. There has been no woman involved. Who was created with no woman involved? No. God wasn't created. <laughs> God made Eve. Remember, Adam was involved. He was knocked out and asleep, but his rib was used to make Eve. So you have no man or woman. You have no woman involved. Um, you have no man involved, which is a virgin birth. And then you have man and woman involved, which is everybody else. Um, so did I buy you enough time? Oh, why is the virgin birth important? Because the sin nature is passed on through the dad, I believe. Okay. The, that is, yeah. The sin nature is passed on through the father somehow, okay? And there's some really... <laughs> no, that's not actually true. Because <laughs> you still have the sin nature. It's just, it gets passed on from the father... Somehow? Yeah, right. Um, no, that actually enters into a realm of theological debate. So the important thing is to believe that the virgin birth happened. Okay? There is a realm of debate on how that happened. How did God do this virgin birth? How, with the man passing on the sin nature? That is where a debate lies of, I'm not sure, um, but the fact is, it is important because somehow, because the sin nature is passed on through the man, somehow, because the woman doesn't pass that on, that's how Christ could be born. Um, some have used the terminology that Mary was like a surrogate mother, where it was placed in her womb, but she wasn't actually the mother, so... I don't know. This gets complicated. I. But then she gave birth to him, so you'd still call him her, his mother. Well, true, but see, just because he came out of her, everybody would call her his mother. But what the point is, there might not be any DNA connected. I don't know, quite honestly. I know what happened. I know God did it, and I know that. It's important because it, it sets him apart. He didn't have a sin nature. Now, why is that so important? God can't be connected to sin, or he, he's not sin. You know, he, he can't have anything to do with sin. Um, and if he did take on sin, at, as if he took on sin as part of humanity, then he'd be a sinner and his death wouldn't be effective for you and for me. Yeah, so it's important that when Christ went to the cross, he was sinless. It's important that when he was born, he was sinless. Um, we, don't have, we don't have much about the early life of Christ. Uh, it's interesting. Um, my wife and I were flipping through some different um, TV shows and I was looking for documentaries. And there was this one, it was a skeptic of, he's just going around trying to debunk everything he can about Christianity. And one of his arguments was, if you're writing a biography about the Son of God, this guy lived on earth, why wouldn't you say anything about childhood? And he's like, that just shows it's, it's false. And I'm like, what kind of a... Well, I wanted to use a less nice word uh, than that because I'm like, their point was not anything to do with his younger life. Their point was his ministry and his, his life as a, as a man and, and what he did. They're not centered on his growing up years. And so we only have a few instances of that. And that's where um, a lot of the 
apocryphal gospels fill in a lot of gaps that really are crazy. Uh, do you know what I mean when I say apocryphal gospels? <laughs> okay. Apocryphal is, or um, they are part some of of sometimes the New Testament apocrypha. Um, you might have heard them, and you're going to hear them around Christmas and Easter. Every year they pull these up. They're like Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Mary, all these other quote-unquote sacred Christian writings that are old and secret, and all of a sudden we dig them up and put them on the History Channel and say the Bible's wrong. Okay, The Gospel of Peter has a walking, talking cross. I mean, like the cross is walking around talking and and a lot of those Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, it, it has a lot of weird stuff in it. And it has Jesus as a boy. Man, I'm really getting off topic here. Anyway, it has Jesus as a boy. Some He's playing with some other boys, and one of them gets mad at him. And so Jesus, he's playing in the mud, and somehow he makes these birds or something that attack the boy or some weird things like that. And and like Jesus pronounces that one boy should die and he goes home and dies. And it's just like, this does not ring with the rest of the gospels. I bring that up because how many of you have ever read any of those? Okay, I was assuming none of you have read them, okay? Apocryphal ones. If you want some, I have some to read. Um, they do not ring true as scripture. That's one of the reasons the early church, they may have read these. They may have enjoyed these. They may have circulated these, but they didn't include them in the canon of scripture because they didn't hold the, the level of, they're like, nah, this is not inspired. Um, so you can have good faith in that you have all the Bible you need to have, all right? Um, some were, yes, um, some books, well, the Catholics still include some, but most of theirs, I'm not real familiar with what they include New Testament-wise. I know more about what they include Old Testament-wise. No, there's two groupings. Um, there's the pseudepigrapha. I'm sorry for throwing out big words. Okay. Okay, Mark Twain was a synonymous, what do they call that? A fake name. A pseudo... Yeah, it was a pseudonym for Samuel Clement. That was the actual individual who wrote Samuel Clement. He wrote under the name Mark Twain. Okay, pseudepigrapha books. Man, I'm really getting off here today. Oh, anyway, you're getting history. There you go. Pseudepigrapha is... It literally means false name or false writing, but it doesn't mean that what's the content's bad. What it means is it's someone else writing under someone else's name. So you have like in that pseudepigrapha and apocrypha together, you have like um, the book of Judith, you have Tobit, you have first, second Maccabees, you have first, second, third Enoch, um, some of these other books. Wow, I'm really getting off today. This should have been in the Bible lesson. Um, the point is, we can trust Scripture, and the other accounts of the Gospels of Christ do not, per even though they highlight his childhood, they may have some stuff that's true or not, but they're not reliable. We just can't know. And um, we can trust our Bible. And when a skeptic says, well, because the Gospels don't include anything of the early life of Christ, they must be all hogwash. It's like, you have no idea of the culture, nor do you have any idea of what the driving emphasis of the writers were. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all have different emphasis in how they do their biography of Jesus. In fact, if you pay attention closely, some of them switch stories around. And... If you're trying to put a chronology together of the life of Christ, and you got two Gospels that have stories flipped around in their order, you're going, which one really comes first? I'm not sure. And uh, Luke flips one of the stories, and so there's a little debate of how which one comes first. Um, 
it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. They were writing with a purpose. If I was writing about an individual and I was writing about their academic career, I would leave out a lot of details about their early life and I'd briefly cover that and move on. If I was writing about an individual and I centered on their marriage, I would leave out a lot of other materials. If I was writing on a person and I'm centering on, like a lot of Christian biographies, their spiritual life and their journey of faith, well, I'm going to leave out some details. Does that make sense? And so it's not, whenever we write, whenever we speak, whenever we communicate, we choose what information to put in and we choose what information to leave out. Does that mean we're lying? No. But we are coloring the story, okay? And so the, the gospel writers were focusing on different elements and different things. There's a lot of overlap between them, but there is a focus to each of them. Um, and so it doesn't, none of them focused on the early life of Christ because it was not, it really wasn't that significant to their main points. Wow, that was long on A. Let's go to B. <laughs> All right, Christ took human flesh so he could fully identify with man and become a substitute for man. Verses here include First John, or excuse me, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. On down in that chapter, John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. First John 4, 2, Hereby ye know the Spirit of God, even the Spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the, in the flesh, is of God. I'm going to pause here. First John 4 is a very helpful chapter when it comes to dreams, visions, or spiritual encounters. Has anyone ever told you, I saw a vision, I saw an angel, I saw this, and it told me this or that, the other? Have you, have you ever had someone say that, or maybe you've had that happen? Okay, I know people here in town who've said they've encountered spiritual beings, encountered whatever it be. Now, Satan is an angel of light. No, he's an angel of darkness. He appears as an angel of light, right? So, if he can appear good, and he's a deceiver by nature, this chapter gives us one of the tests if something supernatural happens in your life. There is a test. And chapter 4 of, of 1 John gives some other tests. But one of the tests is that the spirit or whatever this spiritual entity is would confess to the fact that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Why is that so important? Why is it so irritating to spirits, to demonic spirits, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? If he didn't come in the flesh and didn't die on the cross, he wouldn't have defeated them. The incarnation and death of Christ are the symbols of defeat to the demonic realm, which is why they're important and significant for us as believers, uh, which is why in liberal theology where they deny the virgin birth, they said, no, that didn't happen. That's just a bunch of hogwash. Um, they're really opening themselves up to a lot of dangerous truth and teaching. Um, and as the Bible calls it, the doctrine of demons. So... 1 John 4 is a great chapter to remember for how to test the spirits. Uh, let me be clear. I, I'm, it's possible to have a vision today. It's possible to have something happen. I do not think it's normal. I don't think that's the normal course of how God speaks to us. He's given us the written word. We have the Bible. And yet, um, I spoke to people, and I've, I've been for, there for things. God is not limited but if an angel or somebody comes to us and it conflicts with scripture or that angel or being will not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, then it's, it's, a, uh, it's an evil spirit who is trying to deceive us. So 
Again, I've got off topic a little bit there, but anyway. Second John 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and, the anti and an antichrist. Here again, the importance of Christ coming in the flesh in, in people who do not believe that. They're deceivers and antichrist. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his woman, or excuse, his son, excuse me, made of a woman made under the law. So Christ took on flesh so he could fully identify with us as well as so he could be our substitute. It was in his body that he took on, he was able to take our sin on him on the cross. Um, there's a, a video series our kids have watched and they did a really good job picturing this. You know, some sometimes the kids series get really cheesy, but they had Christ on the cross and and as he was dying, they had these little black blobs of, and they represented sin, attaching themselves to him like static electricity, you know, attaches stuff. And when Christ went to the grave, all that sin went with him. But when he arose, that sin stayed in the grave. He paid the death penalty for sin. He rose in newness of life. Um, he rose without the sin. So your sin and mine with him went to the grave. It's buried. It's done with. And we can experience also that newness of life. C. Uh, Christ, although he had flesh, was sinless. Um, we call this sinless infirmities. Does anybody know what I mean when I say a sinless infirmity? In, in what way? Because he was human, he was hungry. Okay, good. He got hungry. He got sleepy. He got wore out. Wore out. He got, probably got sick. You know, I mean, um, he probably cut his finger. You know, it's, he was a carpenter. He probably got a splinter. You know, there are things to being human through. Whether it's, you know, sickness, whether it's, well, sickness is part of, from the sin and the curse on the earth, but um, we get tired. We we need to go to sleep. We need to eat. We need to drink. Those are things we need. Did God need those things? No. But in taking on humanity, Jesus now needed those things to live. He needed to eat. He needed to drink. He needed his sleep. Um, and they're not, it's not sinful to do those things, but those things definitely wear you down as far as they limit you to some degree as a being. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 7.26 For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. There is an argument I've heard, and I've actually dealt with it face on, that, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever heard this, Christ sinned before he knew not to sin. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, I've heard it right right here where, where we are. Christ sinned before he knew not to sin. Well, according to these verses, Christ never knew sin at all. And if Christ sinned before he knew not to sin, he's still a sinner. And, and if he's God, he couldn't sin right. Um, there's also a... Yeah, there's also a thought that Jesus didn't know he was God until he got baptized. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. did, no, I don't think he did. He knew he was when he was 12. Yeah. But one of the, mo one of the popular movies that came out recently of, in the last five, ten years of Jesus has him 
not knowing he's God until he gets baptized. And it's just like, if he's 12 at the temple and he already knows I must be about my father's business. Yeah, there was other times when he was talking to all the yeah. priests and the priest in the temple. Yeah. And his earthly mother and father were looking for him. He says, why are you worried about me? I'm doing my father's business. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> I'm just saying there's some crazy stuff out there, um, which is why it's important to stay in God's word. Um, and sadly, some of the crazy stuff, this is going to sound weird at first, so hear me out. Some of the crazy stuff actually comes from Scripture. Okay, When the King James was translated, they deliberately didn't smooth everything out perfectly to where they interpret it. They wanted you to be able to interpret it. They wanted you to dig in and study. Well, some people have taken, you know, they... They take an inch, you give them an inch and they take a mile, you know. And the Bible has been used to condone many bad things, many heresies. And it's like, whoa, time out. From the whole context of scripture, you're pulling up something and you're, make, you're blowing it way out of proportion. And so even the thought that Christ sinned before he knew not to sin, that's argued out of Isaiah chapter 14 with the virgin birth prophecy. That's argued out of the following verses. And so we don't have time to get into that interpretation to deal with it. But um, Christ did not sin before he knew not to sin. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Number three, Christ's resurrection. After being killed, Jesus was raised to life again. Romans 1, 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know what? I'm looking at the clock. I think we'll have to stop this lesson for now and we'll pick up next week. Any comments or questions? I went on lots of rabbit trails today. <laughs> I, I will say um, when we talked about scripture as being inspired and we talked we talked a little bit about the canon. Did, we didn't say much about the canon of scripture, did we? Okay, so you're getting a freebie. Why do we call it the canon of Scripture? That is canon with two N's. We're talking canon with one N. It is a type of camera. A cannon was a measuring rod, okay, which I, I never looked this up, but I'm sure if you go back in the history of cannon products, like the camera and the, I bet you that company named their company Canon, saying we set the standard. I think that's kind of their, and that's how I remember it is we set the standard. There is a standard to which all the books of the Bible must we, we need to know that, hey, this, this book was written by a, you know, for New Testament, an apostle or a close associate. Or, in essence, there's different proofs about it because, honestly, there's a lot of books of the Bible we don't 100% know for sure who wrote it. You know, the book of Job. Did Job write it? Or some conservatives think Solomon actually put it together. You know, we don't really know. Um, but there's, there's a canon and there's a rule and ultimately what books have stood the test of time and what books have, this is going to sound almost mystical, they ring as scripture. You know what I'm saying? Like you can pick up something and know this, this is not scripture. Um, I've read some of the Old Testament stuff and I enjoy it. I read the book of Jasher. It's a fun read. It's it, the Bible mentions Jasher twice. It's a fun read. Is it the Bible? No. They've got a lot of mistakes in it, a lot of things that don't match Scripture. But it is interesting. You have added stories of Genesis and Noah, and you have... The ta they're standing on the Tower of Babel, shooting arrows at God in heaven, trying to kill him. And you've got some weird stuff. Did it actually happen? Probably not. It's probably folklore. But I'll say this, all that stuff 
it, it's coming into our culture today, but it's not coming through people reading it. Where do you think it's coming from? No? Movies. Movies. You ever watch some of these movies about the Bible? There's all sorts of different ones. There's, and some of them, when I was preaching through Esther, I found one that had been done on Esther. So I'm like, I want to watch this. And there were some things that I go, where on earth did they get that in the Bible? And I found where they got it. It wasn't the Bible. They got it out of the Mishnah, which is some Jewish writings. And I don't have time to get into all the, that of the Mishnah and the Talmuds. But anyway, that stuff creeps in through the movies. And do you see how the, whoever's making the movies is trying to put a twist on the Bible that isn't in the Bible? Exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well. Yeah. There is. Right now, what's selling is supernatural. In the last 20 years, the supernatural has really taken off in American public interest. It started way back with TV shows like Bewitched. How many of you maybe remember that? The, it was Bewitched. It, it was it was the the man who was normal, but his wife was a witch. You know. But it's moved on into modern series like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and some of these other ones that are, yeah, there's a lot of it. And it's, there is an inward desire in, in us as humans for something more. There's a desire for the supernatural. That's why we like Superman and we like the different superheroes because it's, it's something more and it's something exciting. God wants, he has, he has actually placed that spiritual desire within us and he wants us to satisfy it with him, not with these other entertainments. And what really bothers me as a, as a pastor and as a student of scripture is even the stuff that seems innocent like Harry Potter. I mean, that's, many Christians label that as innocent. I'm going, for one, the writer of that is a self-proclaimed witch who claims that most of the stuff in there she's actually done. And secondly, the only way you can think that's innocent if you believe that's all pretend. And I'll tell you what, I've read enough of my Bible to know that stuff is not all pretend. There is a reality there and a darkness there when people, I mean, this is all through the Old Testament. People would worship idols, they'd bow to idols, why? So they could get something out of it. And it was a power or it was a something. Um, don't mess with it at all. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story and we'll close out with this. There is a lady on the south side of Des Moines. Um, she is a psychic. And you'll see business cars of high class people going in there to get their palms read or whatever. And my dad... Eh, and some of his coworkers had to work on her appliances at various points. And one guy got so fed up because she was not so easy to work with. He said, if you're such a psychic, why can't you just tell me what's wrong with the appliance and I'll bring the right part <laughs> and stormed out of her place. So there are charlatans, there are fakes. Okay. There are people who it's, it's a magic trick card show, but there is a dark side to all that that is real. And it's, it, it's, I don't want to say scary, because if Christ lives in you, nothing in this world has power and authority over you. Um, however, that stuff can be real and very real, and um, it's not to be messed with. So we got kind of a long ways from the doctrine of Christ, but let's close out. We're at 1015. We're right on time. So, Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us, and Lord, we thank you that in Christ all the principalities of darkness have been defeated. We're thankful that in Christ, 
You took on the form of flesh. You died on the cross so that you could pay for our sins. You could liberate us from our own sin and from the power of darkness that, that seek to entrap and ensnare us. Lord, we pray that you would let us center our lives on Christ. Lord, it's not simply just the fact he came as a human, but he identified with us. He took on flesh. He knows what it is to walk in our shoes. Lord, would you help us to look to him in everything this week in your son's name. Amen.